Nice to have a live prayer leader. Uh, sometimes we have to go with the recording, but in the flesh is always better. Uh, turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 7. I still have to think to myself, don't tell you to grab on a blue Bible under the chairs in front of you since they're not there, uh, but I hope you're bringing your own. And if you don't have one, um, I hate to say it, but pull out your mobile phone and follow along. Uh, that's second best, at least. It's also uh, accessible through our app. You can find um, a Bible translation through there. We're in our sermon series in the Gospel of Mark, and the fast-paced action, scene after scene, slows down a bit, at least in this check section of Mark chapter 7, as some opponents of Jesus confront him, and they get into a little bit of back and forth. The reason they confront him is familiar to us these days. It has to do with hygiene, but it has eternal implications because it connects to something at the heart of the gospel. Mark chapter seven, starting in verse one, listen carefully. These are God's words. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. <laughs> When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father and mother is Corban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their mo father or mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evil evils come from inside and defile a person. This is God's Word. Let's pray. Lord, there's drama. There are firm words. There are strange customs. But we ask that your spirit who inspired these words 2,000 years ago, that same spirit would be powerfully at work here and at home amongst live streamers to give us clarity to see what you would have us see and ears to hear what you'd have us hear. Work new life, renew in us an understanding of how to become clean. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. First, we start with wash them hands. Verse 1 tells us that 
Pharisees and teachers of the law had come up from Jerusalem. If you were to draw a map of all of Jesus' travels just from the beginning of Mark until this point, it would look like the scribbles of a three-year-old back and forth all around the Sea of Galilee up in the northeast corner of Israel, back and forth across the lake. You can't see all the details, but the, the number of names that are associated with the shore of the Sea of Galilee tell us how many places we know Jesus went back and forth to. So these leaders traveled about 60 miles. Jerusalem is that little red circle. You can't even see the edge of it. They traveled about 60 miles through rough terrain, north, skirting Samaria, no doubt, because it was unclean. And not knowing where Jesus was back and forth, they probably camped out, hoping that he'd come through town. Maybe they had spies, informants in these towns telling about his whereabouts, and that's not crazy to examine, uh, to, to imagine, because as early as Mark chapter 3, the Pharisees wanted Jesus dead. This was serious stuff. So when Jesus lands in Gennesaret on the southwest shore of the Sea of Galilee, in their surveillance, what did they catch Jesus doing? His disciples weren't washing their hands. And I bet you they weren't wearing their masks either. You know, a bunch of ignorant fishermen going to get everybody sick. They weren't washing their hands. You know, I came across a few public health advisories that might have been helpful for the disciples if they had seen these things from either Baby Yoda or that little guy on the bottom. Uh, That would have taught them the importance of washing your hands. We know that today. Hygiene. But no, these political and religious leaders are not offended because they're worried about disease. They're offended because centuries of tradition have become cultural and religious markers, a core of their identity, and they were being ignored. Verse 5. Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? What is this referring to? Well, four to five centuries before Jesus, a bunch of scholars that became known as scribes were prominent. And these scribes took God's law from the first five books of the Bible, the Torah to the Jews, and they developed increasing levels of detail surrounding all of these categories of law so that by the time of Jesus, devout Jews had thousands of rules and regulations that covered every particular circumstance of life. That was the tradition of the elders. These leaders believed that if you disrespected that oral tradition that had been handed down and treasured from generation to generation, that you disrespected God. They treated it equal to the law of God, in other words. Here's the thing. There were God-given laws about cleanliness in the Old Testament. During our annual public reading of Scripture, some of you are lucky enough to get a slice of Leviticus. And there's some interesting stuff in Leviticus, including in chapters 11 through 15, stuff like defiling skin diseases and bodily discharges. If uh, if you read that chapter, you remember it. (laughs) You need a little therapy afterwards. And and there's there's a chapter and, and several sections about defiling mold that gets on your stuff, and worst of all, that might infect your house. The scribes are appropriately concerned about what is clean and unclean because God came up with that idea and gave it to his people in the law of the Old Testament, but the scribes miss the fundamental reason why uh, why God gave these cleanliness and laws to his people. Uh, the, The simple reasons were easy to understand. They, they cultivated health among the people. They taught a bunch of ex-slaves that had just left Egypt uh, a thing or two about life in this fallen world. Like, if mold gets on your stuff, you got to get it off in a hurry because it will spread. And if it infects your home, eventually you need to tear it down. There's, there's no going back. And the reason is Clorox wipes were especially difficult to find back in this first century as well. You just couldn't clean things off. But the ultimate reason God gave these cleanliness laws to his people were because 
things that were unclean reminded the people of God of spiritual uncleanness due to sin, which prevented any human being, all sinful, from being able to approach God in worship, let alone live with him. He being perfect and holy and other, us being sinful and unclean. There's more about the Pharisees to note here. They were mostly laymen, whereas the scribes and the teachers of the law were the scholars, some of them sort of the ordained types. And, uh, but despite the differences in the Gospels, we often find these two groups uh, mentioned together. They, um, the, the reason they're mentioned together is, is because their religious and their political motivations uh, often overlapped. They wrongly believed that the, the coming of the kingdom of God would be brought about if they got rid of Rome. This is part of the Roman Empire. The, the Romans are ruling, they're occupying, they're restricting freedom. They wrongly believed that for the kingdom of God to come, Rome had to be gone so that a spiritual religious state could be restored. The differences between religion and nationalism became blurred. Now, that's not a, a surprising thing when you think about the history of Israel because it had been a theocracy, a, a country ruled by God. The king was supposed to be godly, right? Faith and, and nationalism did go hand in hand, but when Jesus arrives on the scene in the first century and announces, Mark chapter 1, that the kingdom of God has come near he introduces a whole different kind of revolution. Things will not be like that anymore. His revolution, revolution looks very different because he's teaching in dusty little towns. He's going around healing the sick. He's speaking with a new kind of authority. He is um, ministering especially to the oppressed and the marginalized. He's unconcerned about the power brokers. He's not trying to curry their favor. And the Pharisees hate Jesus because he threatens their nationalistic interests. He doesn't vote the right way, and they want him dead. I'm going to step to the side for just a minute from the text because I think there's some relevance here with just a little over two months to go before the election. And let me show this. Be very careful that your faith, that your sense of what it means to follow after Jesus as a disciple and, and what to believe and how to behave, that none of that is shaped by your political ends, by ideologies other than what is revealed and given to us by God through the Scriptures from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation. If you think that one party or one set of policies is clearly more biblical than the other side of the aisle, may I firmly suggest to you, you're missing something. Because the Bible is neither blue nor red. It doesn't fit into these Washingtonian categories. And no voting... Um, should be done in light of biblical revelation without, as I put it, holding, pinching your nose while pushing that button or turning that lever or filling out that piece of paper. Last thought here. Notice Jesus' response to this question from verse 5. He actually doesn't answer it. Instead, he rebukes his critics by exposing their heart motives, and he doesn't sound very polite when he does this. Isaiah was right when he, when, um, when he prophesied about you hypocrites. Ew. This isn't Jesus meek and mild. This is Jesus being the prophet, speaking truth. He exposes their heart motives. He doesn't answer the question. And when he starts answering the question later on to the crowd, he's not addressing these leaders. When he starts to answer the question, he's still focused on the heart, the core of who we are, the internal root of desires and motivations, what fuels thoughts, words, and actions. That leads us, secondly, to the stain on every person. The way Jesus addresses this issue, talking about what it means to be unclean, he makes 
this a universal issue, not just something religious people should be interested in. There's a common human experience that something is missing, that something is broken that needs fixing. People search their whole lives for a key, for, for some morsel or experience or, or um, possession that brings meaning to life, that, that, that answers the question of why am I here? What, what on earth is my purpose? For some of you, there is a stain that will not wash away. There is scar tissue that will not stop bringing pain because of your individual failure your bad decision, or someone's sin against you, and you've been a victim. For all of us, a sense of inadequacy in whatever sphere of life produces insecurities, and we are scratching and clawing for status and significance and approval. There's universal human experience here, and if you look to the Bible for answers for something more hopeful, what you'll find is first terrifying, but then ultimately, if you keep looking, if you ask for spirit eyes to see, you'll find it to be absolutely hope promising. Why do I say terrifying? Because the Bible will first show you that your condition is far worse than you ever realized. It goes deeper. The stain is more pervasive the uncleanness because of sin is actually treason against the king. There's no way of getting around that. There's no way of avoiding the penalty, it seems. Um, uncleanness because of sin is rejection of the wise one's wisdom. It's a rejection of the perfect lover's love. It, it is a, a pride-filled, arrogant statement. Sin is, all of sin, that my wisdom is greater than yours, God. That the way I love is more pure than the way you love, because if you were God, you wouldn't do these things to me, to my loved ones, to the world. The uncleanness goes far deeper than you realize. It's terrifying when you look at the scriptures that expose this, but the Bible will also show you that the only real hope that is offered is available to you through faith in Jesus, that God has provided a way of cleansing. We'll see that in a few minutes. In May of 1960, an Israeli undercover agent named Peter Malkin was waiting for a man to get off the bus from work to walk to his house, as he did every day, and he sees the man, and with other agents in the struggle, they threw him into an unmarked van and drove off. The Mossad agents had finally caught Adolf Eichmann, the notorious on-the-run Nazi SS lieutenant colonel who was in charge of identifying and then transporting the Jews to the death camps to provide the final solution to the Jewish problem, as the Nazi regime put it. As Malkin guarded Eichmann, waiting for the uh, airliner to secretly smuggle him out of Argentina and back to Israel for a trial, Malkin said this, here I see a man like you and me. Because Malkin knew full well what a monster Eichmann had been, what he had done to his descendants, his family members, and so the last thing this Mossad Israeli agent expected was a sane, intelligent, sociable man looking just like him and his peers. Ordinary. Two years later during the trial in Israel, Time Magazine's reporters wrote this. They described him as um, a thin, balding man of 55 who looked more like a bank clerk than a butcher. And by butcher, they're not talking about the guy who grinds your meat and hands you a shrink-back package. A butcher, a monster. He looks more like a bank clerk. Last quote, uh, philosopher Hannah Arendt wrote a book about Eichmann in which she described him as neither perverted nor sadistic, but terrifyingly normal. Why terrifyingly normal? Because someone who would do that kind of atrocity to six million Jews 
you and I want them to be so different from us that they're like in a whole other category of humanity. What's terrifying is someone you might be a neighbor to, someone you might go to work with, somebody you might ride the bus with, somebody you might play soccer with, somebody you might sit in church with. It doesn't seem all that different than you might be that kind of person who would be largely responsible for six million deaths in a genocide. Terrifyingly normal. What's the point here? The stain of sin is on every person, and we're not all that different. Uncleanness is pervasive. You know, by the grace of God, by the nurture of family, by the restraint of law and justice, none of us here is likely to become a monster in life. Those are all circumstances of our lives that we should give thanks for because we've been socialized, right? To, to want to be decent neighbors, citizens, brothers and sisters. But any amount of decency we might claim, we have to realize in light of Scripture is a veneer that covers over or tries to cover over the stain of sin uncleanness that describes every human being, and it's a problem because ultimately it's treason against the king. The Apostle John wrote this in his first letter, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we claim, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. There, there is a means of cleansing that God has provided. Confessing is agreeing. That's what the word means. It's agreeing not just that you've sinned. Oops, I did a couple things wrong. I checked off these bad boxes. Confessing is agreeing not just that you've sinned, but that you are a sinner and that at core something needs to be transformed. Something needs to be brought back to life that has died not just flawed and broken with weaknesses, but in rebellion against the Creator. That's why reading Scripture will terrify you, because you're far worse off than you realize. But biblical confessing also means agreeing by faith that the solution that God has provided in the death of God the Son in your place is sufficient and is the solution to uncleanness. Back to Mark chapter 7. Jesus and his disciples are now inside the home, verse 17, maybe sitting down for dinner, and the disciples ask the question, what were you talking about back there, Jesus? <laughs> what did you mean? He rolls his eyes. <laughs> he sighs deeply. <laughs> uh, are you still so dull Verse 18, I'm not exaggerating, right? Are you still so dull? They had heard verse 15. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. They heard verse 15, and all they, all they can think of are, are bathroom jokes. You know, what comes into the mouth goes down, gets yucky, and you need to get rid of that. You know, middle school joke, snicker, snicker. Um, that's all they can think about. What, what are you talking about, Jesus? Here's his point. This way, in the mouth, into the stomach, intestines, and out the other side, cannot make you unclean. Don't worry about what you put in there, which means bacon-wrapped scallops are back, by the way. Praise the Lord that we're New Testament believers. Um, now, Jesus says, that way is not what you should be worried about. That's the external stuff of mere religion. What Jesus says is, no, uncleanness that I'm talking about is this way, okay? And, and stop talk, thinking about bodily functions. This way is from the heart up overflowing as sinful thoughts, words, and actions. This was an absolutely revolutionary thing for Jesus to say, in particular in his time, in his faithful Jewish context. Orthodox Jews today would still reject what Jesus is saying. Don't worry about what goes in here because it just goes out the other side. They'd be offended. 
In William Barclay's commentary on Mark, he refers to 4th Maccabees. It was a book written uh, one or two centuries before Jesus. And, and there are accounts of persecutors of the Jews, pagan, um, like Syrian king, the Antiochus Epiphanes, for example, persecuting the Jews and wanting them to do the equivalent of recanting their faith, of rejecting their faith. And what would he want them to do as a symbol? Eat pork. Here's some bacon. Eat it. They refused. And in 4th Maccabees, there's a, a story of a widow with seven sons. That exa- it, it, it amplifies the situation, right? This is her only hope. Seven sons. And the persecutors are making them eat pork, and one by one, they are tortured to death in her presence. Fingers cut off. Limbs removed. One person burned to death And each one died because they refused to put something unclean into their bodies. This is how serious this tradition of the elders was in in Jesus' time, making his statement incredibly offensive, revolutionary. You could understand why he was a bullseye in the Pharisees' rifle spots. Against that backdrop, Jesus pokes the religious bear what goes into you can't make you unclean. It just comes out the other side. What comes out of you is the issue. He was being deliberately provocative here, not to offend. That wasn't his intent. But he was being deliberately provocative, and he wasn't avoiding offense because something at the heart of salvation was at stake here. His opponents were teaching a self-salvation strategy. Do your best to obey thousands of little details of rules and regulations in covering every minute of your day, life at home and work and worship. Do your best to obey and God will be pleased with you. It's up to you. Just do a better job. Be more careful. That's mere external religion. But Jesus was proclaiming really good news because why is his good news and that bad news because what what happens when this is all up to you? You realize how far short you fall. You realize you can't climb that mountain. You got three quarters of the way up and in one moment you fall all the way back down because you can't keep it all. You're a sinner. Jesus proclaims real good news. You can't, but God has. It's not your work It is God's gift that you simply need to receive. That's really good news. Stop striving because you won't get there. God will make it happen. This is the internal transformation and cleansing that only faith in Jesus can bring about. You know, it's easy to manipulate your image, to put on a a facade uh, on the outside so that people see a, a, a certain um, brand or version of you, right? And let, let's be honest, um, haven't you had the situation or the experience, perhaps regularly, where your attitude, your tone of voice, the words that come out of your mouth, the decisions you make are different when you're at church or in the office or in a classroom compared to being at home in your kitchen in your pajamas, right? Would we each not admit that, yes, sometimes, if not all the time, I act different. I yell at home, I don't yell at work, you know? I'm short-tempered and annoyed at home. But I'm, I'm polite and, and genteel and patient and, and generous and offering to help people in, in these other contexts. Why? Because you're afraid of the consequences. You don't want people to not like you, to brand you as a selfish guy. You don't want to pay the consequences. You don't, you don't want to get caught. You don't, you don't want people to criticize you. you. Why is deep conflict that much more likely to happen between you and the people closest to you? It's because you can only hide who you really are for so long. You can go to work and behave all day. Remember when we used to go to work? (laughs) Um, 
And then you get home and you let your guard down. And the people who are closest to you, maybe a roommate, um, maybe a friend you hang out with after work, maybe your family, they bear the brunt of the real you. Luke chapter 6, verse 45, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And what happens is the people who get vomited on from the filth of your heart happen to be the people closest to you. That's the sad reality. The closer people are, the more accurately they expose your heart because you just can't fake it all the time. The real you eventually leaks out. When Jesus describes all of the stuff that comes out of a person's heart in verses 20 through 23, I can't help thinking of stories that have become all too common these days that circulate on social media. For example, a drunk guy late at night in some bar starts raining down racial insults upon the bartender who's been serving him all night. And somebody pulls out their phone. That's going to happen all the time these days. And this guy becomes an eight-second viral video. And you and I can predict what the statement shared with the media the next day and on social media sounds like. Right? We can predict it because we've heard it very often. Um, that's not me. That's not who I am. I'm so sorry. I have no idea why I would say such things. What would Jesus say? Verse 21. I'm sorry. Um, verse 15. It is what comes out of a person that defiles them. And then verse 21, it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Jesus would say, no, that was actually in there. It just came out because alcohol loosened your lips. Someone else under the influence at an office party, remember those as well? Inappropriately touches a coworker, says something sexually suggestive, and the next morning, we can predict what the statement sounds like. I, I don't even recognize in myself the person who did that and said that to you. I have the utmost respect for you. And what would Jesus say? Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. That desire was there. It's just that without alcohol, without smoking weed, without the peer pressure of the locker room to pull it out, what's truly there is usually kept in check. It's suppressed by social approval, by fear of punishment. You don't want to lose your friends. You don't want to get fired. You don't want to get sued for sexual harassment, so you don't say what's really there. You keep it bottled up, but drink loosens it up, and you don't realize, oh, I shouldn't have said that. You don't want your bad behavior to become the latest eight-second viral video is the reason you typically bottle up what's in the heart. This is why the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought because every human heart is unclean and has that stain that you cannot rub out with a pile of good deeds. Last thought. This is the only cleansing possible. It's not that the ritual purity laws that God did give his people in the Old Testament were a bad idea, and Jesus said, don't worry about those. You know, didn't mean that. Those didn't work. This is not the message of Jesus whatsoever, because everything in the Old Testament, divinely inspired by God, flowing out of his heart of, and mind of love and wisdom, was given to his people and points forward to ultimate reality fulfilled in Jesus. Everything. So cleanliness, I couldn't even type it. I had to keep looking at the word. Cleanliness laws taught an important lesson to the people of old about the need for purity in order to draw near to, let alone dwell with, a holy, perfect, pure God. But we're still unclean in our sin, and if that's the case, what is the solution to rub it out, 
to provide access to God. How do we get saved, we might put it, from the stain? Something else from the Old Testament laws can help us understand. Animal sacrifices, all throughout the Old Testament, no longer needed, not because they were a bad idea, but because Jesus fulfilled what those sacrifices of the blood of bulls and goats represented. Jesus became the ultimate, final, perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God who was slain for the sins of the world. And when he died on Calvary, actual forgiveness of sin was accomplished when the blood of bulls and goats, Hebrews tells us, could never accomplish it. It was just a pointer ahead to Jesus. He has come. So what happened on the cross? Paul explains in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God made him who had no sin, perfect, clean in every way, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Paraphrase. God the Father made God the Son who was perfectly clean, obedient, and righteous in every way. He made him unclean. That's, a, that's not right. You're absolutely correct. It's the greatest injustice that has ever happened in history. God made the perfect son to be imperfect. God made the clean son to be dirty and unclean and stained. He received judgment that our unclean hearts deserve. He took our place so that all who believe in Jesus might be cleansed because payment in full was provided and he walked out of the tomb in victory over our sin and its consequence of death physically and eternally. You cannot do this yourself. If you try, you will either develop pride because you're generally good at following all the rules while you remain far from God, or you will wallow in self-condemning shame and guilt because you're not all that good at following rules and regulations. The gospel, good news, is so very different It upends that system. It trusts that the Holy Spirit can give you eyes to see what God has done for you in Christ. And then, because you have nothing to offer him, empty hands to receive that gift and then praise him in response. This is the gospel according to Mark. Let's pray. Jesus, this is amazing grace that you would take our place Never let that truth, never let that idea become commonplace. Let it wash over each of us to show us, those who are believers, more deeply our uncleanness still, but the extent of your forgiving grace, and to show those who don't believe their need of the Savior, who alone is Jesus, who alone provides forgiveness and freedom, who alone can remove the stain of our hearts and present us pure and blameless in your presence. Do that work for the glory of Jesus, we pray. Amen.